Well, good evening to y'all. Number 529 will be our number to start with. 529 will work till Jesus comes. <clears throat> i 
Number 496, and if you are able, why we'll invite you to stand while we sing. 496, we'll sing the first, second, and last verse. <clears throat> Amen. Please be seated. Well, it's good to see you tonight. All of the uh, extracurricular activities, if you want to call them, they're 
going to be packed in next week, so we don't have anything special going on this week. But uh, just ask you to pray for the regular services, pray for the teachers, and everything pertaining to God's work. We've all heard of the way the word vacation, and sometimes it becomes visible. So uh, those things do happen. We invite you to open your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and our interest uh, is the furtherance of God's work. And uh, what's involved in that, sometimes we need understanding. Um, sometimes people can get kind of caught up in a, well, what the church is not what it used to be. Well, I'm not what I used to be. And uh, you don't uh, let that become a factor. You just go with what you have. And, of course, God warns us about looking back rather than looking forward. And it's not a wise thing to do is to address what is now and the opportunities that we have now and, of course, uh, to be very much concerned about what our future challenges will be, to have a good understanding about it. So we want to read two verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and there in verse 15 and 16. It says, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, to the other the savor of life unto life. And then who is our, this is kind of the thought that we're pursuing, who is sufficient for these things? A lot of ups and downs in life, and certainly a lot of ups and downs in our church work too. And in order to succeed in life, you have to be able to handle both of them. You, you can't just uh, want all the ups and, and ignore the fact that there can be some downs. This verse speaks of the differences there are in ministering to people, the same messenger, the same doctrine, the same message. To some, it's a savor of life unto life. To others, it's a savor of death unto death. So that means it reaches some, it alienates others. In the 17th chapter of Acts, I think we find an example of this. In Acts chapter 17, and there in verse 4 and 5, it says, Some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, and took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. So to some they were the savor of life, to others they were the savor of death. Now that's the way it was with Christ's ministry. I think you can realize that. And of course there is, and Christ pointed out that there's an underlying cause uh, for the difference that you see in the 15th chapter of John in John chapter 15 and there in verses 18 and 19 he says if the world hate you ye know that it hated me before it hated you if ye were the world the world would love his own but because you're not of the world but I have chosen you out of the world Therefore, the world hateth you. So there's an underlying cause. And then down in verse 24, If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. So Christ said, If I had never said a word to any of them, it wouldn't have been a problem. But since I preached the truth to them and it exposed their error, why then it became a problem. So there was an underlying uh, problem there. So the question then becomes, who is sufficient for that? Are we really sufficient for that? In the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 13, and there in verse 6, Acts 13, 6, says, when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, 
which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And here's what I want to get to. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. It wasn't that he ran out of time. But if you go over to the 15th chapter in verse 38, you'll find that he backed off. Uh, he went not with them to the work. I think it was a little rougher experience than what John was ready for. And so after that kind of rough experience, why well, he decided to go back to Jerusalem. But later on in his experience in 2 Timothy 4.11, you'll find that Paul said he's profitable. But uh, earlier, uh, when they wanted to go on the second missionary journey, Paul said we can't take him because he did not prove out reliable. He did not stay with the work. So we can learn from our mistakes if we humble ourselves before God, and John Mark did. But we can't learn from them if we won't identify them as being a mistake. They have to be identified for what they are. Years ago, there was a couple, and I'm not naming names because that's not important, but they had demonstrated in their personal lives before being married that they had some instabilities and so they did get married and an older individual just out of observation and concern said do you think they're going to make it talking about if the marriage would last and of course it didn't it didn't make it they were not sufficient so i think uh, uh, what we're dealing with tonight is the are we sufficient and if we just take marriage, for example, marriage vows emphasize the need to be sufficient for all that marriage will involve. For example, for the vows, for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, in sickness or in health. It doesn't say you can choose which one of those you want. It says you have to be sufficient for all of it in order to truly get into the marriage relationship as it is going to require you to be until death do us part. So that requires um, quite a, a sufficiency, as many of you know. So not just expecting things to go the way that we want them to go, and if they don't, well, then we're done. And that's what happened to John Mark. Now the, the solution in being uh, sufficient enough to work through whatever we encounter and then we're to make the best out of it. And you know, in marriage it takes two. Uh, you can't just have one person that really wants to make it work. Everybody has to be committed. Every party has to be committed to it. And that's the same way with, with the Lord's work. In the book of uh, Second. Corinthians chapter 3 and 2nd Corinthians chapter 3 I want to point out that Christians involved in God's work we have a tremendous advantage to where we can be made um, sufficient for the work in 2nd Corinthians 3 5 not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves but our sufficiency is of God who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. 
Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. And so our sufficiency is of God. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and there in verse 10, Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. And so in the 28th chapter of Matthew, when Christ gave the Great Commission to uh, do his work through a local church, he said, all authority was given unto him, all power in heaven and on earth, and that we were to go therefore because of his authority and his power. And then he said, I'll be with you always. I'll be with you always. So if we're with the Lord and he's with us, we find we can draw upon the promises that God's made. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. And uh, there is a sufficiency for us in the Lord, and all things are possible to him that believeth. Paul knew this very well in his ministry in the book of 2 Timothy. We will go over there in the fourth chapter. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to look at some of the things that Paul dealt with tonight and how that he had to be sufficient for these things. And by the grace of God, he said, I am, not of myself, but by the grace of God. But here in 2 Timothy 4, 16, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. So what effect did it have on him at that point? He said, I'm praying for God to be merciful unto them. But in verse 17, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of a lion. Now, if the Lord had not been the factor then when everybody else forsook Paul he would have caved but the Lord was a factor so in verse 18 he said the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever amen so serving the Lord is never about having a support group that is going to uphold us in our position. That's not what it's about. It requires a sufficiency to go ahead and remain true and faithful no matter what others do. It's not a matter of what somebody else does. God never fails us, and that's what he said in verse 17. So since God is not going to fail, we must not fail either. And that combination a person in God is going to be sufficient. So the outlook that faith is to have in verse 18, the Lord will make the difference. The Lord will deliver me from every evil work. The Lord will preserve me. And so therefore that's the sufficiency that Paul is referencing. Now I want to go back to the book of Job a little bit and deal with the question that we must not allow our own expectations to defeat us. Uh, we may have expectations, and then when they don't happen, why, you know, you can really get let down. But here in Job chapter 1, and there in verse 20, Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. In chapter 2 and verse 9, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? Shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. 
Job never expected any of that to happen. He never expected that there would be a day in which that all of his earthly possessions would be taken away from him as well as the lives of all his children. I mean, that's unheard of almost. He never expected anything like that could happen. Job's life, if you go back to chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So you couldn't really find um, a better person than Job. His life was about as good as it can get, and that doesn't mean that we can just peek out because we know that God can continue to work with us. But Job experienced that life was not just about how good things were for him. He experienced that. And it became a matter of just how sufficient would his faith be when all of this happened to him. Because he had to control, or let's say he had to contend. He had to contend with another player. You know who that player was? The devil. You go back to chapter 1, and there in verse 10, Hast not thou made, this is Satan accusing Job before God, Hast not thou made a hedge about him? and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Have you ever heard the saying that a person has a price? Well, the devil says we've all got a price. And if certain things don't line up good in our life, then we will quit. We will not go on. So that's what he told God about Job. He said, you take everything he's got, and you're going to find that he becomes a very bitter and resentful child. So what does that mean? It is a mistake to tie our attitude about serving God to the way circumstances are going. Because they were really bad with Job. I want to go over to the third chapter of Malachi. In Malachi chapter 3, if Job had tied his service to God into the way that things were going circumstantially, here's where he may have landed in Malachi 3.14. Ye have said, it is vain to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? So if Job had tied everything in to the way things were going, he would have said, I've lived a faithful life. I have been upright before God, and look what it got me. You see, that's what happens if we tie our attitude about serving God to our circumstances. So it's a mistake also to let what others do or don't do have a bearing on our, our devotion to God. And I want to remind you of something. When Christ was arrested and brought before the council, all of his disciples forsook him and fled. Every one of them. If he would have tied his continued service to God to what his supporters were doing, you see, it wouldn't have worked. They all forsook him and fled. Now, let's, let's look at Job again. In the 16th chapter of the book of Job, Job's friends, and here in verse 1 and 2 of Job 16, Then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are ye all. Miserable comforters. Well, in chapter 19, there in verse 3, These ten times have ye reproached me, Ye are not ashamed that ye make yourselves strange to me. So they were really going after him, uh, just about as strong as they could. And then in chapter 16, and there in verse 20, in chapter 16 and verse 20, he said, My friend scorned me, but mine eye poureth out tears unto God. And then in chapter 27, 
you see where he landed in chapter 27 and there in verse 5 and 6. God forbid that I should justify you, talking to his friends. Till I die, I will not remove mine integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. So his faith was about remaining faithful to God, remaining true to God. He knew it would be a mistake to let what his friends did or what his friends did not do become a crutch for him to break off from being loyal to God. So we learn from Job that our sufficiency must come from our faith and trust in only God, not anybody else, not in what we think is going on because a lot of times we don't really know what's going on. You know, Job didn't really know what was going on. But he kept his faith and trust in God and uh, he was wanting to make sure that he remained sufficient in the area of faith. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God tells us that there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And God will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able, but he will with the temptation also make a way to escape. Over in Hebrews chapter 4, and we see what that way is. And we see what that escape is. We see what that sufficiency is. Here in Hebrews 4 and verse 14. Seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities. But was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Not let self, not let anything that goes on keep us from seeing what the real solution for our experiences is, and that's Christ, our high priest. Jesus alone is the sufficiency of our salvation. Jesus alone is a sufficiency that enables us to negotiate life and what's involved in serving God. So that's what we are to be centered upon. Now I want to think about the church a little bit and we'll look at churches in the New Testament and that is who is sufficient for these? Who is sufficient for these things? In Acts chapter 2, in verse 46 and 47, you find a church on the rise. And that is that they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. You can imagine at this time what it would be to be in the midst of that church. Praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. But just a little further in the book of Acts, in chapter 8, <clears throat> eight and there in verse 1. Acts 8, verse 1, the same church. Saul was consenting unto his death. At that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Who was sufficient for that? You know, if they would have just been thinking that the church ought to be like it used to be, and I remember when, well, it had been very disappointing, wouldn't it? So considering the sufficiency of faith this required, just stop and think about that. All these people, there were thousands, not just a few, but all of a sudden their church was reduced from thousands, rejoicing, praising God, souls being saved unto scattered, except the apostles. Who is sufficient for that? In the 20th chapter of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 20, Christ raised this issue 
when his disciples were thinking ahead a little bit, and they were thinking too much ahead because I guess there had been some discussion, I don't know, but anyway, the, the mother of, of some of the disciples came to Christ and said, got a request. He said, what's that? Well, when you're in your kingdom, grant that one of my sons may sit on your right hand, the other on the left. You know, that's thinking ahead pretty far, isn't it? Uh, I want to be in a certain place in heaven. Well, in verse 22, Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what you ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? To be baptized with a baptism that I am baptized with? And they say unto him, We are able. Now they declared that they were sufficient. Of course, we know they had problems with that a little later on down the road. But <clears throat> think about the cup that Christ drank, and that is total self-sacrifice, dying for others that we might be saved. The cup he drank to be baptized with a baptism he was baptized with. The ministry of Christ was a little over three years. The first year was, is often called the year of inauguration. And that is when he made himself known and people began to see him and wonder about him. Then his second year was a year of popularity. More people were flocking to him by the thousands. And in the sixth chapter of John, there was even a movement that wanted to make him king. Why? Well, he could feed him. He demonstrated that he had all power. But the third year, it all went upside down. The year of opposition. And from then to the cross. So from just in a little over a year's time, being the most popular man, unto away with him, crucified. Who is sufficient for that? Well, that's what Christ said. Are you able to drink of the cup? that I'm going to drink and to be baptized with a baptism I am baptized with. Now, in the 28th chapter of Matthew, in verses 11 through 15, when Christ had resurrected, the guards, the soldiers that had been placed at the tomb, they saw the angels come and they saw the stone rolled away they saw that Christ was not in it, that he had resurrected. And it was such a fearful sight for them, they became as dead men. But after they recovered, got their strength back, they went straight to the religious leaders. And they told them what had happened. And you know what the religious leaders did? They bribed them to lie about it. So what does that tell you? That tells you that the leaders... In Jerusalem, religious leaders were not going to accept Christ anymore, period. It didn't matter what he did. He would be marked for their opposition. You go over to the 19th chapter of John and you'll find out that the Roman government sold out to them. Because they put it to Pilate like this. He said he's a king of the Jews. Anybody that goes along with him is not Caesar's friend. Pilate caved in. Said, well, I can't go there. You know, I can't uphold Christ because I'll be looked upon as a traitor. So basically, the leaders in the Jewish society, they weren't going to accept Christ, period. The Roman government was not going to go along with Christ. And you'll find in the 12th chapter of Acts that Herod, who was a Roman official, he started killing uh, some, of, some of the apostles, he killed James, and then he had Peter arrested, but Peter, God delivered him. But here's what I want you to think about for a moment. For Christ to emerge again, because he was on earth, I think, uh, I don't know exactly, I think some 60 days after he resurrected, there might be some reference on that. If he were to emerge again into a public ministry, there would be an all-out war against him, an all-out war against him. So he told the disciples in John 16 and verse 7, it is expedient for you that I go away. So it would not work for Christ to stay on earth and continue. Uh, that would just be like in Revelation chapter 20 and verses 7 through 9, after the millennial kingdom of Christ. 
The devil motivates all the world against the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, fire comes down from God out of heaven. So the Holy Spirit would come and take up his role as the comforter and the power of the church. And guess what? Nobody could get the Holy Spirit. Uh, I mean, there was nothing that could uh, work against him. First of all, they couldn't see him, and they had no idea what he was doing. But in John chapter 16 now, thinking about that, that there would come a time of a drastic change needed. Christ could no longer be on earth and to lead the church because that would just be all at war if that was to be the case. So in John chapter 16 and verse 1, These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogue, yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. You're going to have to be sufficient for this. Right um, up until this time, there was still some leeway for Christ to be with his, his disciples. The opposition was really beginning to mount. But he said there's something else coming that is beyond where we've been. It's not going to be the same as it has been. And you're going to have to face it. And so, who is sufficient for it? Are you going to be able to drink of the cup that I am going to drink on? Drink of. So from there on, Christ is telling them, the work of God is going to require a new sufficiency beyond yourselves. And it's going to be a matter of enduring and overcoming. And will you be sufficient for that? In the 24th chapter of Matthew, when Christ spoke of the last days, and there's a lot that was said about uh, the way things would be for the work of God, but we'll just touch on a little bit of it. In Matthew 24, 10, Then shall many be offended, shall betray one another, shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I want to go over to the 10th chapter of Acts. Christ told him there's a whole lot of things coming in the future that's going to be different than just a church meeting together, praising God, and having favor with all the people, and the Lord heading to the church. There's going to be a whole lot of things that you're going to face. In the 10th chapter of Acts, And there in verse 24, this is when God led Peter to go to Cornelius. And in verse 24, it says, And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And in verse 44, you find there was a a good number of them saved. That's the way it works in the beginning. You know, when there is a ministry just starting, why people come, they hear, they get saved, they go home, they invite their families, they invite their friends. So they come and it seems to be real good for a while, doesn't it? I, I can recall how that was. But after a while, it's like selling life insurance. You know, if you uh, happen to... Uh, see a job offer to sell life insurance but what you'll do you'll sell to all of your friends and family that know you and then you'll finally run out there'll be a saturation point so when it comes to people being brought into a a work and people getting saved and people bringing their family and their friends in that works for a while and then finally there becomes a saturation point you don't have any more friends to invite the ones you invited they either accept it or they wouldn't come back so the saturation point happens well <clears throat> what are you to do at that point a lot of times we just quit we quit inviting people but 
the, the Lord says you keep going. You keep going. If you read Luke chapter 14 in verses 15 through 24, the Great Supper, invite those, uh, bid them come that were invited. Well, not enough. Okay, go out in the, in the streets and lanes of the city, invite them. Still room? Okay, go out in the highways and hedges. Isaiah said, how long, Lord? The Lord says, till there's nobody left. But a lot of times, after we get to that saturation point, we quit. We've already tried all of our friends and all of our family, so we quit. Well, from then on, it becomes a matter of maintaining and enduring. Now, I want to just give us some quick references, and I see by the clock we don't have time to go to all these, <clears throat> but uh, think about the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth was enriched in everything, as you read in chapter 1. In chapter 2, Paul referred to the fact that he preached nothing but the word of God, to where that the people's faith and hope would be in God and not in man. Then he challenged them to be followers of him as he was of Christ in chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about people that started examining Paul. And they started thinking of him as someone that was walking after the flesh and not really one doing the Lord's work. So if you go on to the end of 2 Corinthians in chapter 12 and verse 15, he says, the more I love you, the less I'm loved. The less I'm loved. Now that takes some sufficiency. When you have devoted time in building a church, you have taught that church, and finally it comes down to the point they don't even want to recognize you anymore. Don't even want you to be around. Well, the churches at Galatia, similar thing. Uh, they started out, and it was a blessing. They looked forward to the fellowship. But you move on into the church at Galatia, and you'll find Paul saying, Who did hinder you? He said, There was a time you would have given me your eyes to serve you, but he said, Now, am I become your enemy? All right. That required a lot of sufficiency on his part. You think about the church at Ephesus. Revelation 2, 4, they left their first love. They had lost their affection for the church. They lost their affection for its ministry. The church at Pergamos in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12, they were allowing people in the church to dabble in idolatry and also to commit fornication. That was, that was going on. Well, the church at Thyatira had a very similar problem, led by Jezebel. You get to the church at Sardis in Revelation 3, 1, God says they're dead. You know what that means? They were just going through the motions. They had become satisfied just to attend, just to attend and do nothing more. Then you go on to the church at Philadelphia. They were under attack. People were lying about them, spreading rumors and stories, talking things about them that was not true. The church at Laodicea, Laodicea became self-satisfied because they were prosperous. Well, all of those, I'm pointing out, all of these churches started out. They started out joyous. They started out, boy, you know, this is great. And then things began to happen. People began to change. This, that, and the other. And came to a point, okay, who's sufficient now? Who's sufficient for these things? So it matters not what age it is. It doesn't matter who the people are. It doesn't matter what we're dealing with. We still have the same question, who is sufficient? Are we sufficient? I want to go to 2 Peter chapter 3 as we bring our thoughts to a close and think about being sufficient for the Lord and the Lord's work. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also. You know, it's not always the other guy. 
So beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Are we up to the task? You know, Christ said when he comes again, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find people who have been sufficient, who are still sufficient? So we need to make sure that our service is loyal to Christ. And as he told the church at Sardis, um, he said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. May we bow our heads for prayer. Our Father, we, we know we're blessed and we're privileged to be a part of the body of Christ. We know there are ups and there are downs. And just as in marriage or any other, uh, other relationship that will be challenged, we know that the work of the Lord is challenged by human nature, is challenged by the devil, and there are so many things that can happen. And we need to be sufficient for it because we are the stewards of the work that you have given us to do. What a privilege it is, what an honor it will be to have been found faithful when we meet you and you come again. So bless us and help us to, as the scripture says, gird up our loins that we can be found faithful and strong for you and to take our place with the Lord Jesus Christ to be willing to drink of his cup, to be baptized with him. And so we pray thy will be done in this invitation for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand with